Good morning, everyone. Mm -hmm. Thank you for coming. A few things are a little different this morning, as you'll notice. First, we have roll call, right? Or I, yeah, we, okay, we're going to get to that in okay. just a second. First of all, we have a little bit less time than usually. Today, we will spend time together for only two hours instead of the usual three. Uh, secondly, unfortunately, we do not have enough members of the ISC present today to meet our quorum. For that, me for that reason, we will not be able to take any action on any agenda item today, any necessary action will be deferred to the next IAC meeting, which I believe will take place in August. Lastly, the format of today's meeting is a little different. It's a, it's a workshop rather than just an update to the members and to the public. Um, I find this little change quite exciting for today because this workshop is intended to be much more engaging um, and more of a dialogue with our members of the IAC. I was actually just informed that this is considered a retreat. I don't know what your idea of a retreat is, but yeah. um, for me, a retreat Workshop. involves uh, <laughs> palm trees. But uh, it's, it's going to be much more engaging today. Lisa, can we have a roll call, please? Thank you. Present. Here. Here. Thank you, Lisa. Public comment, we move on to public comment. Public comment will be taken during this agenda item. No action may be taken on a matter raised under this item until the matter is included on an agenda as an item on which action may be taken. Comments will be limited to two minutes per person. Persons making comment will be asked to begin by stating their name for the record and to spell their last name. The council chair may elect to allow additional public comment on a specific item when that agenda item is being considered. Do we have any public comment? Hearing none, thank you. Moving on, before we move on to the, the President's update, to our next um, item, I, I just want to make sure that um, I just offer a reminder and an, an encouragement or a heads up as we initiated at our previous meeting in, in February. Uh, I would like to ask everyone, every member of the IC, to share your, your takeaways with the group towards the end of the meeting. It's important and helpful to, to reflect on relevant things that we possibly do well, and especially those that we do not do too well yet. So thank you for that. We're going to move on to the President's update. I, I want to make sure uh, you're aware that all mics are, are hot. Uh, you're not going to have to, to, to press a button. Your, your mic is going to, going to be hot anyway as soon as you start <coughs> speaking. Okay, so before I begin, I would like to invite, I don't think there's anything legally wrong with this, I hope, I would like to invite uh, Kyle, <laughs> Dean Dalpy, Dean Julie Ellsworth, and Associate Vice President Elena to come sit with us and participate fully in the meeting today. Um, I, I probably should have given him a heads up before, but, yeah. but it just would make more sense You're because right. when Elmar and I talked about today, uh, well, first of all, for those of you who are new, rest assured, we typically have much better attendance. <laughs> we, we really do. Um, we typically are missing one or two members of the entire council. We had a meeting scheduled on May 4th, and then there was a special Board of Regents meeting that needed to happen, so I was called away, so we ended up postponing the meeting. And when you think about it, uh, Elmar and I talked about it and thought, you know, well, we could wait till the next meeting in September, but it seemed like a really long time between May 4th and September to not conduct an IAC meeting. 
So we decided that maybe we could do a workshop, or uh, I won't use the word retreat because this isn't retreaty enough, but, but maybe, maybe we could do a workshop and take that opportunity, especially to invite some of our newer IAC members to come and talk about new programs and also the way in which the college gleans data to help shape the directions of the college. So, so with that said, we are trying, we, we're, we're, I'm so thankful for those of you who could make it today because for many of our IAC members, this was actually short notice, right? It was very short notice. Usually the meetings are public, published well in advance. People do uh, make every attempt to clear their schedules and to be here today. So I'm very appreciative of those of you who could make it here today. I'd like to use some of my president's update time just to do introductions. So if we could go around and if, for those of you who work for the college, to share a little bit about your, your job title, how many years you've been at the college, and a fun fact about yourself. And I would like to ask all of those around this table to tell a fun fact about yourself, and just as a, a way of getting to know each other a little better. So why don't we start with Julie Ellsworth. Oh, nice. <laughs> oh, Hi, good morning everyone. Yeah. So I'm Julie Ellsworth, I'm Dean of Sciences. Um, and I have been at the college for 15 years. I came in as a biology department faculty member um, and earned tenure and served for three years as the department chair um, before moving into the dean position. Um, and so there are things um, that I really miss about teaching, but I'm really excited for all the sort of the challenges and problem solving and um, sort of fun work I get to do at the dean level. Um, fun fact. Oh my gosh. Oh, We've done this before. <laughs> you just went to Philadelphia. That's pretty cool. Yeah, so I'm a complete sort of history nerd um, and a bit obsessed with the Hamilton musical. And so I kind of go to every museum in the world, if I can, that has anything to do with that kind of period of American history. So that's sort of the fun fact about me. I know fun facts about everyone who, who reports <laughs> through the management <laughs> teams. Good morning. Uh, my name is Elena Bobnova. I'm the Associate Vice President for Research, Marketing, and Web Services. I've been with the college for 19 years. Um, I worked for UNR um, for a number of years. I worked at the system office, so I've been around a little bit. Um, and um, I am enjoying, for the last two years, I'm enjoying all sorts of new things that have been added to my plate. So that's what happens when you just don't leave and stick around. So you get to do all sorts of interesting new things. Um, fun fact, um, I don't know. I am a runner. <laughs> you, a so, marathoner? Yes, a marathoner. So, and we are, here's a fun fact for you. Um, we put together an RTO team between DRI and TMCC um, because we got so inspired by the RTO that just finished. And we did not participate in that, but we will participate next year. DRI and TMCC challenge. Yay. Does everyone here know what RTO what is? Because I it's did Reno, not know. Reno Tahoe Odyssey um, relay run. Right, so. it's a race from Reno up to Tahoe, through oh. Truckee up to Tahoe, down to Genoa, mm -hmm. through Carson up to Virginia City, and back into wow. Reno. A total downtown. of 178, yeah. 70, 78 miles. My turn, okay. Good morning, I'm Kyle Delpy. I'm a Dean of Technical Sciences. I've been at the college 15 years in a variety of, of roles. Um, have uh, ridden the wave of the uh, recession, which means more things get piled on the plate. And since the Hamilton and the running were taken, I'll go on to the next fun fact. Um, I, do, um, I do a lot of goofball things. Um, I do have a puppet collection. I'm a fan of the Muppets having grown up in the 70s. I don't share that with many people. Since this is a public meeting, I guess it's out there. <laughs> yeah. um, it. Freaked out my staff a little bit, but it does help with engagement with even high school students because they, uh, they, if they see that you have some sort of a, a little bit of a humor in your step and, in your, and as you talk about things, then they tend to listen a little bit more and then we can sell them on higher ed when they're not thinking about it. So yeah. thank you, welcome everybody. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. I'm Cynthia Olivo. I work in admissions and records. <coughs> I am there as a functional lead for Radius and Starfish, which are two platforms that we recently purchased. Um, I also am here representing Classified Council as the president for Classified Council. 
And a fun fact, I've got a couple on my water bottle. I ran leg 30 of the RTO last two weekends ago, and I've done the Tahoe Room Trail solo hike last summer, Great. which I wouldn't have been inspired to do if I hadn't been at TMCC. <laughs> well, I'm Cliff Macklin. Um, for most of my life, most of my adult life, I've been an, an investment banker, um, but primarily focusing on international transactions. I, when I stopped actively managing portfolios, I decided I was only going to do the fun stuff related to portfolio management. And so I morphed into doing strictly strategic planning for, for businesses. And um, a fun fact about myself is I am the current three-time world bodybuilding champion for uh, Masters Division. In my first contest this year, so I, I got to keep, I, want, I got to win at least four more times. I got another fourth time, and that'll be in August, so. Right. So that's. Congratulations. That's, <laughs> it's fun. It, it allows me to focus on excellence. Yeah. It's a fun fact, I guess. That is a fun yeah. fact. Yeah. And no one's going to mess with you. <laughs> that, that too. <laughs> I'm a nice guy. I'm a teddy bear. Yeah. I wasn't questioning it. Yeah. <laughs> My name is John Madole, and for many years mm -hmm. I managed the Associated General Contractors here, so I guess I'm sort of the de facto construction representative. And uh, I guess for a fun fact, I would say. I'm probably the only guy sitting at this table that somehow managed to plunk out of college twice and still graduate. <laughs> Good for you. Never quit. Uh, good morning, John Thurman. I'm uh, the CEO for Nevada Works. We're the local workforce development board uh, here in the northern part of the state. We're funded 100% by the Department of Labor out of the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act. Um, and uh, have been on the uh, IAC since its inception and uh, was a member of um, the advisory council. They had a different name before with WNC, so I've been in, kind of in around this. Uh, I'm not sure I have any really fun facts uh, about me. I'm a pretty quiet and um, unassuming individual, but I did get my way through college by driving a motor coach all over the East and Midwest. Uh, so I visited a lot of those historical spots. So. Cool. Very good. Hello, I'm Jared. I'm the SGA Vice President, and I've been here for a good month. <laughs> and for a fun fact, I recently got my wisdom teeth out. Oh, <laughs> you <laughs> oh, very good. Now, Jared, were you? A, uh, I I remember meeting you as part of the transition, the Student Government Association. SGA means Student Government Association. Were you a TMCC high school student, or are, are you are you or not? I know there were two or three of you were. Yeah, I'm with the yeah. You are okay. Great. So, um, one of the things that that you may or may not know is that we have a high school embedded into our college and it's really become I would suggest a magnet high school and almost it almost like an honors high school mm -hmm. and so it's just wonderful that Jared is here participating and and will be um, a the are you the SGA pre vice president vice, vice president. president and and at some point you'll meet Atsidi who will be the SGA president next year who is a, another great student. So we're just really fortunate that we have this happening. And the, the last thing I'll mention about that is the model is very interesting because, did you come as a sophomore? I think you can come yeah. as a sophomore or junior, but now they're coming as sophomores. And their first year they, they take <coughs> classes from high school teachers, but here on campus. By the time they're seniors, almost their entire course load uh, is out there with part-time faculty uh, or full-time faculty mixed with all the students, so, so there's no difference. And when did you start taking college courses from college <coughs> faculty? Uh, <coughs> last year, maybe? We did take some sophomore year, right, like okay. two classes each semester, and right. then 
starting <coughs> junior year, like only all but two are college okay. classes. Right, and so when you hear about TMCC High School, it's more than a high school on campus. These students are taking the majority of their courses <coughs> with other college students of all ages. And, and so it's a, it really is a partnership between Washoe County School District and TMCC. It's not just leasing space. Does that make sense? And I think it's important for IAC members to understand that because we have all kinds of dual credit opportunities now coming <coughs> on board. But back to introductions. Karin Hilgerson, president of TMCC. Um, fun fact about me is, is I love Zumba. <laughs> <laughs> not as much as my uh, standard poodle Isaac. So that's another fun fact. Mm -hmm. And I do my best thinking immersed in a swimming pool with no one else around. Okay, there you oh. go. <laughs> Emma Davi, good morning. I'm the TMCC IC chair. Spent the last past uh, decades, past two decades in international manufacturing in the US, in Europe, and in Asia. Uh, been in Reno for the last two and a half years managing and restructuring various uh, different companies and currently in the process of building a new company in Reno. I uh, do not have a public collection. I don't even have a pet. I'm um, <laughs> not sure yet what fun fact I'm working on that fun fact. Okay. <laughs> All right, my name is Joe Nanini. Uh, I'm the Director of Clinical Experience and Assessment for the College of Education at UNR. And Congratulations. <laughs> and oh, has a new job. That's just starting in July. Uh, <laughs> yeah. nice. So I, a fun fact about me is I'm a musician. Um, and I also sit on the Art Town board, and I would encourage all of you to come check it out this year. We have some incredible stuff going on, so that starts here not too long. Hi, I'm Julie Muley, and I'm coordinator of the Dental Assisting Program, and I'm here as the incoming vice president of, of NFA. Almost forgot who I was. Um, <laughs> and a fun fact, which is kind of rivals Kyle's for weird, um, <laughs> is that, or special, unique, I mean. Um, my, my neighborhood likes to decorate for Halloween a lot, and my husband is Beetlejuice, which means I get to be Mrs. Beetlejuice. <laughs> uh, good morning. I'm Nate McKinnon. I'm the Vice Chancellor for Community Colleges at NCHI. Uh, so I'm not a member of your IAC, but uh, certainly try to be at all your meetings. Um, and I started here in, uh, in Nevada in July last year, moved from Massachusetts, uh, and it's been great being here, and we love living here. Uh, fun facts, um, despite what it looks like, I'm not a runner. Uh, sorry, Elena. You so, will be, aren't I know, you, you, you want me on your there's team. No more, you no, you made it very no clear. We'll talk. Uh, <laughs> no, a fun, a fun fact about me is uh, for years in, in Boston, I hosted um, a weekly pub trivia that got to be very large and popular. Uh, and actually, it's how I met my wife. Uh, I like to say that she fell in love with my voice. So that's me. My name is John Albrecht. I'm the general counsel to TMCC, the Desert Research Institute, and Great Basin College, which is the community college in Elko, and I get to attend two IACs, this one and Great Basin. Fun fact about me, this morning was my last Rotary meeting as president of my Rotary Club. Oh. So I will not be late anymore. I will be on time if you start at 8.30. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. Congratulations. Good morning. Good morning, my name is Marisa Brown. I'm the Workforce and Clinical Services Director at the Nevada Hospital Association. And I've been on the IAC since its inception as well. I've been with the Hospital Association eight and a half years. I'm a nurse. And um, a fun fact about me is my son just got married to um, his girlfriend of seven years. And I, I found out after they'd been dating about three months that I was her mom's labor and delivery nurse, and, <laughs> and so her daughter was named after me. I guess I, I mean, we didn't find this out until later, but I impacted her so much that she named her daughter after me, and so now we have the same name. Oh, wow, that's great. <laughs> Which is an unusual name. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah it is kind yeah. of unusual, yeah. That's great. So that's a fun fact. That's a good fun fact. Yeah, I'd say that's like the best fun fact of yeah. the morning. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I do have a couple of updates, and mostly related to the last Regents meeting. Uh, I think one of the things that, that occurred at the meeting that will be really good for TMCC is that a 4% uh, 
although the students might not think so, a 4% tuition increase for the next, uh, for the 2019 and 20 years was approved. The reason that's good for TMCC <coughs> is it aligns with a index called the HEPI index, Higher Education Price Index, which looks at all of the rising cost in higher education around, uh, you know, materials and, and travel and things like that. And, and the HEPI index is at, the, the new one just came out at 3.8%. So the reason that's good news is we will be able to recoup some of the HEPI index rising cost through student tuition. The downside is it's more cost directly to the students. So, however, um, the other thing that I wanted to mention, and it kind of goes along with that discussion is we know that we do need to try our very best to, to work on faculty compensation issues. And, and one way to help colleges and universities in the system to do that is to have more flexibility in our budgets and so that we can do some things locally to help faculty uh, gain some of the compensation that they lost between the years 2008 and last year. And just for a little bit of background, uh, so in the past, prior to the economic d disaster, I don't know what else to say, uh, that followed 2008, NSHE employees, faculty, would, were on a step schedule where they received 2.5% per year for every year of employment. I think I have that right, correct, Julie? Yeah. And so you can imagine that, that, that they were going up a salary schedule at a pretty good clip, probably at the, one of the highest rates of progression salary-wise in our country, truly. That all ended, uh, and not only did it end, but faculty were asked to do furlough days, that uh, people were, so these individuals at the um, middle of the salary schedule were basically frozen Meanwhile, in the last three years, or well, actually since about 2012, in order to get people to work at NSHE, then what tended to happen was new people would be hired slightly below or even above some of the individuals who had been in the system since about 2007, for example, and that causes a thing called compression. So in the next few months, you're going to hear a lot about this thing called compression, and that's what that means, that you've had leapfrogging hap happening. Um, at the last Board of Regents meeting, we probably listened to testimony for about, public testimony for about an hour. And it was mostly UNR faculty who, I, I got to be honest, when I was done listening, it, it really, I mean, there are some definitely legitimate concerns related to compensation. Um, and, and they also affect TMCC. We have a similar problem here as well. Although unlike the other NCHI institutions, we did do a, recently a thing called an equity adjustment. We started the work shortly after my arrival. There had been a committee meeting prior to my arrival, but um, I pulled the trigger on an equity study just in time before we received a letter from the chancellor uh, saying free, don't do any more equity studies. So our, our folks had a little bit of a correction, but not nearly enough. The chancellor is going to put together a supplemental budget request uh, that will be part of the legislative request in the event that the revenue forecast comes out higher than anticipated, there will be um, a, an opportunity for all of us to try to request additional dollars for faculty compensation in particular. And, and, but that was a big topic at the Regents meeting. So those were the two big updates that I would put out to you is, is compensation was a, a focus of the meeting and the other, the other focus was tuition increases that the Board of Regents did approve on Friday, I think it was Friday. So, and is there anything else that I'm missing just in terms of broad strokes? And that would conclude my update so that we can get started on the other meeting items on the agenda. So, okay. I should mention, speaking of strategic planning, um, <coughs> Nate McKinnon will be leading the community colleges in an effort this summer to do some strategic planning for 
NSHE, the NSHE system of community college presidents and community colleges. The idea being that if we can isolate the things that we all want to share as a shared service or a shared opportunity or shared direction, then we'll prioritize those and make sure that those kind of, how do I put this, I, I think of wedging, wedging into the local priorities to make sure that we have capacity as an institution to handle the, the strategic planning priorities at the local level, but also working simultaneously on those system level priorities that could help all of us. Does that make sense? So that's the plan. And I think it's a good plan. Thank you. Anyway, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the update, Madam President. You're welcome. Next, I'd, I'd like to welcome our visitors this morning. Thank you very much for joining us. <clears throat> we still have a couple of introductions to make. I would like to, to formally welcome two new members to the TMCC uh, Institutional Advisory Council, Ms. Gigi Chisel and Mr. Clifton Macklin. Has Ms. Chisel arrived yet? Okay, Ms. Chisel is absent today. Um, however, I, I do want to take this opportunity to introduce her to, to, to the board. Ms. Chisel is a graduate of the University of Nevada. She received her bachelor's degree in business administration and her master's in public <laughs> administration. She has been with the Lewis Group of companies for over 30 years and serves in her capacity as vice president overseeing various aspects of the company's commercial development activities. I want to welcome Ms. Chisel to the TMCC IAC and uh, look forward to having her join us in, in August at the latest. Mr. Macklin received his MBA in finance, specializing in quantitative methods for analysis and securities and portfolio strategy. He's a founder of Macklin International and has served the Carson Tahoe Regional Healthcare Center as an advisor on finance, investment, and strategic planning since 1995. Mr. Macklin served in the Vietnam War as an infantry platoon leader and acting company commander from 1969 to 1970. Mr. Macklin, sir, thank you for your service and welcome to the TMCC ISC. Thank you. In addition to our two new members, I would like to also welcome and introduce Dr. Sesh Kumuri. Dr. Kumuri is sitting right behind me as a visitor today. Dr. Kumuri received his bachelor's in electrical and electronics engineering in Hyderabad, uh, his master's in electric engineering in Kanpur, India, and his PhD in engineering uh, at the University of Texas in Arlington. Dr. Kumuri is a professor at UNR and has a very long record uh, of serving on various academic research uh, committees and councils in the states of Oklahoma and Nevada. He will, for the time being, join the TMCC IAC in an advisory capacity. Dr. Kumori, thank you for joining us this morning. Next, we move on to item number five, um, industry employee direction. Um, Vice Chancellor McKinnon, you're going to, to, to recognize the energy strategic goal plans. We are still, uh, as of, of the meeting in February, trying to line our topics, our discussion, our discussion topics with the strategic goals uh, that NG is setting for the state of Nevada. So we, we appreciate the guidance on that. We will not be able to address all um, NG strategic plan goals today, as you see based on the agenda. Um, our topics are limited to access, which is number one, uh, success, which is number two, and workforce, which is number four. However, I, I believe that the very next topic is, is going to be very, very exciting. This item is twofold as we will be reviewing and discussing the results of the recently performed needs assessments for both the Smart City Technologies Program proposal as well as a proposal for a quality assurance program. The needs assessments reports were shared via email with all members recently along with the agenda for today's meeting. I do want to confirm that everyone received um, those documents. Uh, Lisa was kind enough to send this out. So to start us off, I suggest that um, both Dr. Delpy and I believe Amy Williams is not, is not yeah, here yet. Uh, I we have Dean Ellsworth here can speak I, I apologize. I'm, I'm sorry, I That's apologize, right. I didn't see you there. Yeah. Uh, that both Dr. Delpy and Dr. Amy Williams. Ellsworth, yeah. Uh, my apologies. Briefly introduce the assessments and share the highlights. 
Uh, after that, I would very much appreciate if we can have a review together and, and go around uh, the room so that everyone gets an opportunity to share their thoughts, their questions, their concerns, and possibly also praise on the assessment that were conducted with the rest of the council before these two program proposals then possibly move into the next phase of implementation. Thank you. Good. Okay. Thank you. Um, Kyle Delpy, uh, for the record, Dean of Technical Sciences. And I'll start with um, item 5A1 or 5AI, the uh, Smarter Cities. And I'll kind of begin with the end, uh, the, the punchline. Um, we do not believe this is a, a program we can viably support at this time. And when we don't recommend a program being um, ramped up and started, um, we're not shelving it forever. It just really means at this time, as the economy expands, we look at different offerings. So going back to the, the beginning, um, when, we look at, when we look at the jobs in the marketplace, a lot of research coming out now, um, we use a one two, seven model, which is um, one, for every one master's degree, there's two bachelor's degrees and seven um, jobs. Uh, for every, so back up a little bit, for every job that requires a master's degree, there's two that require a bachelor's degree and seven that require less than a bachelor's degree. And that's where we sit at the community college. We're, we're creating technicians, technician level up to the associate degree, and in some cases, bachelor degrees. This is one of those that falls into the, the four-year category and the master's level category. Our colleagues from UNR will note that you have a uh, urban planning degree. It fits into that realm, smarter cities. Um, but there are not a substantial amount of technician degrees in the northern Nevada region. In fact, when we looked at the list from the Governor's Office of Economic Development, which is on page three of the packet, uh, the high demand occupations, this one ranks uh, 584 out of 784 positions um, with only about 70, 76, 78 positions in our regional area, even remotely related to this, that don't exactly come on as a, it, it, it's, it's such a tough fit to, to put all the jobs together that would be related to this. And so there are positions out there, most of them bridge into definitely needing a four-year degree, but they're so minimal that even to create a pathway from a two-year program into the four-year at this time is not, vi not a viable program that we, could, that we feel we could sustain. There is some, some, some chatter on this. Um, we hosted Senator Cortez Masto a couple weeks ago. She came in talking, to smart, talking about smart cities. This was after this was submitted, and I said, wow, but it's all emerging because of the way the economy is growing. As our economy continues to grow, the, the smarter cities technology, the urban planners, the people that put, put, put together the infrastructure that supports the booming industry, that will all grow. So I think in five years we could be talking about this again and saying there are some, some uh, technician level, associate degree level positions that will support the people doing this kind of work. Uh, one other note is uh, section five under the training programs. We do offer architectural design AAD 256. It's in land use planning. It's the closest thing we offer at the college. It's on our curriculum. It has not made in the past three years. We have not gotten sufficient students in there to even run that class. However, on the, on the similar side in that department, we do have construction management, and we do have architectural design technology. We do have some sustainable technology. That's emerging um, sustainable technology classes in those programs, and I think that would be the jumping point for us to move into students into the pathway to smarter cities when and if that becomes viable. Any questions? I, yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Kyle. I'd like to to start off the, the conversation about the, the assessment. <clears throat> Dr. Delpy, thank you very much for, for the work that went into, into the assessment. I, I, I do have a few questions, and some may appear critical of, of the work that has been done since it's meant in a very constructive way, and I acknowledge I may be wrong with my, with my concerns, so I, I do hope so. Uh, first of all, what I, what I really enjoyed going through the assessment is the fact that, that you're referring to, to uh, very credible data sources, uh, that you're referring to, to, to state data, to GOA data, uh, to, to data from the governor's office, and again, to very credible sources. However, my general sense to get to, to the bottom of it is that we are possibly missing the mark with this assessment because my, my sense or my um, impression of what we discussed, my intention of what we discussed over the past couple of meetings was to review the need, the possible need for smart city technologies curricula and 
technologies, programs, what I think we ended up doing is instead of looking at the technology development side, we're looking, we're limiting ourselves to the technologies deployment side because all the data that we are, that we are referencing in the assessment are very strictly focused on urban planning. I do not believe, having been in, 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 in the private sector industry for the past 20 years, that we will be able to expect a lot of innovation from urban planners. I'm sure they have great ideas, but I don't think that this is where we should expect or look for innovation drivers. What is gonna drive innovation are companies, technology companies, software solutions, hardware devices, IoT companies, in this field possibly architects, construction companies. So technology companies, and I believe with, with what we are focusing at, I, I just want to reiterate this point because it's important to me. We're looking at the deployment, which is in this case limited to the 250,000 people of the city of Reno and you know, beyond. Uh, instead of looking at the technology development, which if we dismiss this program proposal and the program idea, we again leave up to the Bay Area, to Southern California, to, to other areas, to tech hubs, to Boulder, Colorado, to Austin, Texas, to all the other areas where we have strong IoT presence and, and technology development. Um, a good example, I, I believe that, that most of us are probably familiar with this company, is Breadware. In, mm -hmm. here in Reno. So they, they relocated, I believe a year, year and a half ago, it's an IoT company, uh, they relocated from, from California to, to Reno, they chose Reno for all the, the, the great benefits and the business environment um, and the drive or, or the, 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 the hunger for innovation that, that we are very familiar with here. Um, and as a matter of fact, they recently met through Edon with the governor. So I see, and again, I may be wrong on this, so I, I invite you really to discuss this and, and, um, and, and, and debate me on that, uh, but I believe that a company like Breadware and many others, they are well positioned to, to develop smart city technologies for law enforcement, for transportation, for entertainment that can then be deployed in Reno, but for that matter, globally, there are really no limits. So that's, that's my, my, my first um, set of thoughts on that. And I invite you to follow it. So, so if I could respond, Mr. Yeah, Chair, so I, I absolutely agree with you. This is a feasibility study for the deployment of the, what we would call smarter city, more of a management or urban planner type category. Um, the, the tech deployment would be something totally different. And I apologize if the, if the translation of the assignment came my way and, and hit, missed the mark. However, when you mentioned breadware and those groups, um, when we talk about, I've had several people come through the tech center who are looking to build clean rooms and environments and technology that can support the industry. That one, to, to speak colloquially, we're all over that one. Um, but what kind of technicians lead into that. That fits into our um, advanced manufacturing a little bit for, for uh, well, a lot. Advanced manufacturing, um, our, some of our machining program and other programs that we have, we are putting people out that could work in those environments, maybe not necessarily to create, create the technology behind it because the engineer level might be at the university, but we, should have, we do have pathways through the, the GoEd's LEAP framework that lead into some of those at the four-year level. So we could definitely package something more along the lines of what you were just speaking to on the deployment side on and the, the development technology. Side. I'm sorry, on the development side. The development, de 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 I'm sorry, development. Sorry, I'm, uh, yeah, I got back backwards. So th this is more about deployment. We're talking about development and creating technology. Yes, yes, because yes, we've got, um, and we have a lot of things emerging on the, on the TMCC side right now. We are actually cleaning out a room right now to, to put in um, our Industry 4.0 classroom that was sponsored partially by the uh, Governor's Office of Economic Development, a half million dollars worth of technology that uh, will, will train people in the Internet of Things so that they can do all kinds of things, whether robots talking to each other or smart thermostats or uh, the technology behind it. So, but we we're building that lab as we speak, and so I definitely see a place for the development piece. Um, and I would agree with you, this is, this is about deployment. Okay. I think that uh, one of the things I've noticed in the last 30 years is oftentimes people 
a conversation gets way out ahead of you when you don't even share the basic definitions yet. Uh, so, because I, I do think there is um, some, uh, a, a lack of clarity as to what, what we are talking about. And uh, so, Kyle, I, I do think that you did what was asked of you. What I hear you talk about, and now I think it's clear because of the breadware example, I, it almost sounds like you're talking about more uh, software engineering related to the Internet of Things. Is that's that, one component of it. That's one component. Right. Okay, mm -hmm. so, let, let me be more and I think that's a good conversation to have. It's, it's, it's a lot of AI. It's, it's a lot of AI. It's a lot of, of yeah. algorithm uh, development. And I, I, I do right. want to make sure. I, I agree with Dr. Hilgesom. You, you did what was asked. Yeah. And I apologize if, um, if, if we were not, not clear enough on, right. the, on the request. So I, I take responsibility for that. Um, but this is possibly a really good opportunity and time to redirect that, to make sure that right. the, end result, the end result will be what we actually want to, to, to look at. There, there's one comment in there which, which kind of baffled me when I read it, but now it makes sense, uh, that Southern Nevada is is uh, currently not engaging in smart city technologies programs, which, as I know from from Ms. Nancy Broom, uh, is is mm -hmm. or Dr. Nancy Broom is incorrect because they, they they are developing the smart city technologies curricula on the development side, not so much on the deployment okay. side. Right, right, right. Um, you you did mention clean rooms, and I. I hope I didn't interrupt you. Kind no, of. I, I want to hear more about that too. No, you did not yeah. interrupt me at all. Okay. Yeah. You, you did mention clean rooms, and I, I I wanted to make sure that I understand the the relationship, the uh, the bridge between clean rooms and smart city technologies. I I used to build clean rooms back on the East Coast for the pharmaceutical packaging industry, mm -hmm. and I don't necessarily see the connection to smart city technologies. I may have misunderstood that. Can you elaborate on that? Uh, the, the, the clean room was a, uh, it was a request by one of our many travelers that come and tour our center and say, if there were more facilities here that ha offered that clean room environment, which I sh we should connect, um, and that, some of that comes up in your uh, the quality assurance, right. yeah, yeah. Um, that, that more industry would move here. Now, not necessarily related to this, but it would be Correct. something that um, right. uh, technology-wise, if we were to advance the technology piece and, and deploy it appropriately, then I think we could have more businesses moving in under that. People that were are actually doing business in town here that um, are shipping things to other markets to use their setups to be able to finalize the product. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, John, you, but, you, you, interesting, the whole conversation in from the development of curriculum as it would relate to TMCC to create or produce um, employees with these skills, I, I, I'm sitting here thinking, well, I'm not sure I see a connection there. The discussion about a smart city, so I, I had to go to Wikipedia here because I'm like, I'm, I, hear, I hear the term, no, I but that. the definition of what is a smart city is, um, a, a, there's many definitions is what I'm finding real quickly. It almost sounds like this is more of a, a, a city planning I issue when you start talking about the deployment of services and systems that create the smart cities. So I, I'm, I'm, I, I can understand why we would be talking about this at the IAC level as far as creating a workforce. And I, I question, I mean, I can't go along with what Kyle's findings were that I, I don't know that it creates enough jobs uh, to ever show up on the governor's uh, sector list uh, or everything. But as far as the city, the community, the, the whole area, should do, do I feel that we should be headed down that path of having a smart city? Yes, I do. So I'm, I'm a little conflicted on where we're going with this as in the IEC. Why is that? Why why are you conflicted with? Well, because I th I think our function here is more geared towards curriculum and programs to develop workforce, if you will, or prepared in individuals uh, to enter the workforce than it is maybe. In, I, I'm not saying we shouldn't have impact on the city and or recommendations to the city or community or the area, whether it maybe it's all of Washoe County, not just. Uh, uh, Reno, and maybe that includes Carson City and, and, and some of the others, but, but I think I'm, I'm having a little struggle understanding what our role is in this discussion. 
Interesting. So just to give an example, my, my wife works in the financial services industry and investment management. And over the past few weeks, she's been all over these AI funds. And she's, she's very excited about this, and, this and, and just tells me every evening about which, which funds and which, which stocks she's looking at, which companies, which AI drivers she's looking at. So this is a, this is a global phenomenon. And I think Cliff was next to. I apologize. Ready. No, that's okay. I, I, I keep it very short. Yeah, that's all right. Um, just actually, to respond actually, to your I'm to, to your point. I'm just it in right now. So I I, I oh. keep it very stop. short. I just keep respond going. to John's point. Yeah. Um, so so long story short, this is a global phenomenon. This is uh, not Reno specific at all. The question is, yeah. as the institutional advisory council to TNCC, um, the one of the premier uh, resources for, for technical education in the region. Um, I, I believe that, that we are very well positioned to provide um, private sector <coughs> advice, industry advice, curricular advice, to the development of technology programs, to the development of technologies that we can develop right here in Reno. Because if it's not being done here, it's gonna be done mm -hmm. in San Francisco, it's going to be done in Mumbai. It's going to be done in Shenzhen or somewhere else. So that's where I see the, the connection. Um, I don't know if you want to respond, but I want to make sure I'll that. Have that to and, add. And, and, and yeah. Cliff, please. Keep going. Keep going. Go ahead. Did, did you want to comment? No, I just want you to keep talking. Yeah. <laughs> it's helpful. <laughs> yeah. It is helpful. Well, any of you three, please. Well, I have a follow-up comment, if I could, if, yeah. you'd, if you'd entertain uh, me to drift off the topic of this a little bit, because you got me a little bit energized when you started talking artificial intelligence and AI, because that's, that's different than, I mean, that's, that's the, that is the deployment in the smarter cities, and we do, I did mention the lab we have, we've, uh, and I'll give you some bulleted updates just for the group, um, and then we can, if you want to task me with a follow-up, I'm, I'm happy to take that. Um, we do have uh, some money from the governor's office coming in to create the uh, Industry 4.0 classroom um, and this is something that is uh, basically will have robots plcs everything in a manufacturing environment talking to each other um, it's not we don't we don't teach this but it's very similar to the samsung refrigerators where you run out of something and it texts it to your list and now you know when you're at the store to pick it up that kind of thing um, and we call it the terminator classroom you know the world's going to take over by robots but we're pretty excited about that not only because it's the way things are going and it's incredibly cool if you're into that stuff but also because the industry is demanding it the the um the gigafactory is very heavy on on automation um, they have we we have a, a guided vehicle they have a, a bigger one that moves the trays all of that talking to each other and so in that vein we've, we've we're creating this lab to teach that but we're not doing it in isolation we also have um, several pathways, we call them leap pathways, it's learn and earn accelerated pathways um, that we work with K-12 and we work with the university and we're in the middle and it's a pathway for students to come through CT and move all the way up uh, in some cases to a bachelor's degree. Um, if that leap pathway doesn't bring them, and one of them is in artificial intelligence. Um, one of the areas that's come to my division is CIT, computer information technology, and there's quite a bit there on programming. Uh, some of that's in Julie's area with computer science, but uh, cybersecurity computer information systems and that kind of thing and we're blending all that together with the with the industry 4.0 classroom we've also put on our NC planning document a bas a bachelor's of applied science and cyber physical manufacturing per request of tesla and panasonic to be able to pathway their people from our 10 credit p3 program into certificates into associate degrees and then either in the pathway to university engineering or into our bachelor of applied of applied science kyle are you so. comfortable with with our distinction between deploy is, is everyone comfortable with the distinction between deployment and, and development? I, I just want to share this with you real quick. Yesterday, using my smartphone, I'm, I'm using the, the, the YouTube app, and I receive an ad. And I was baffled by that. I thought, this is impossible, because this ad was responding to a thought that I had. A thought about a product, a thought about uh, simply an idea, a new idea. I thought, well, this would be cool. I had not talked to anyone about this. I, I thought back, well, did I, did I write any emails? Did I write any text messages? So this ad, it was so specific, so niche specific, it was responding to my thought. Long story short, it is obvious that, that there is AI deployment around us. So on the development side, we know we can decide whether we want to be part 
of the development, the deployment piece is easy. We, we typically have, and I want to make our, our new board members aware of that, we typically have law enforcement um, uh, represented at uh, this council, which is, which is very helpful and very interesting. And I believe that especially in law enforcement, uh, Reno and many other cities would greatly benefit from, from, from smart city technologies and from AI um, in the prediction of, of crime hotspots and other issues. Um, but AI is around us. We just have to decide if we want to be part of the de of the development, not only the deployment. Right. So and can I, I add to this too? Go ahead. Oh, go ahead, Nate. Right. Uh, thank you, Mr. Vice Chancellor. Uh, th thank you, Mr. Mr. Chairman, and Madam President. Uh, let me start by saying that uh, I've attended a lot of IAC meetings for all of our colleges, uh, and this discussion right here. Uh, is one of the most interesting since my time starting in the system at an institutional advisory council. And I think it's great to have our IACs engaging about college directions and program offerings as well. I think part of the, uh, the struggle I'm hearing a little bit is, uh, you know, a chicken and the egg scenario, if you will, where uh, our colleges are very much trying uh, and appropriately so, to respond to employer needs and demands. Uh, and so, and they're funded by the state to do so, uh, to build the workforce. And so the question of do we build it in, in hopes of it coming and, and, and being ahead of the curve or behind the curve, because that seems to be the two options that we, as community colleges, are often struggling with is are we uh, out in front or trying to play catch up? Uh, and, and I think it's, it's a very difficult situation for any institution to be in, <clears throat> especially when there is a sense in an area like ours uh, that we have so many unmet needs when it comes to employers. Um, and so when I hear discussion about, you know, development of uh, the, or deployment of smart city technologies, uh, to me it's a question of, so, so are the employers behind this? Are they coming forward? Are they saying, we want this. And if so, uh, you know, I think it would be appropriate for a future IAC meeting to invite them uh, and really have them here to be able to say and work with uh, or work with the, the, the dean in the interim to sort of say, here are the openings we have that we can't right now fill um, or that we foresee coming in the next year that we know this area won't have the workforce for. Uh, so being able to really have that employer connection, that's part of our design of the IACs is, is being able to make sure that the connectivity between the community and the uh, uh, the community and employers and the college has a living, breathing space to operate. And so, uh, so I first want to say this is great, Mr. Chairman, to have even this type of conversation because I I do think this is one of the uh, the most interesting IAC conversations of, that I've been involved in, and it's it's really great to hear. Uh, but I, I would just wonder, you know, as you move forward on this as a council with the college. Uh, what what you can do in terms of bringing employer connectivity to this because that's what we expect of all of our community colleges is to and to be fair that's what the governor expects and that's why the wind fund is set up the way it is which has to have a direct employment opportunity for those dollars to be able to uh, you know be used to develop new programs uh, for example uh, so i'll stop there now i'm ready thank you thank you now i'm ready so one of the things in kind of synthesizing the conversation, I think I'm starting to realize that maybe we've, uh, maybe we should work on a marketing opportunity related to some of the elements that we already have. Because what I hear from you, Kyle, is we have this industry 4.0 that's that's occurring, and I remember hearing about that, you know, approving something a few months ago. Uh, and that classroom's being set up. I'm also hearing that really we're not talking about smart cities. We're talking about artificial intelligence. We're talking about having, uh, ramping up our computer science programs. And we have two types of computer science programs here. We have the, basically the Microsoft Office product computer stuff. And then we have what I would call hardcore computer science getting ready for electrical engineering here. Uh, and, and that some of those students will take those classes, including the high-level math classes, and they'll transfer to UNR. Uh, and in the middle, in the in-between, I think we have students who can handle a boot camp coding experience like Udacity, for example, that they can, uh, we can work in consultation with the folks at Breadware and other of the small startup software engineers 
to figure out the competencies that our two computer science faculty can teach to those students. So my first question was, do, is there a computer lab near the 4.0 classroom? Because it might be nice to really ramp that up. And my second question, I guess, for my team is, should we be talking about a, an embedded pathway that's called AI, called artificial intelligence, and really market the hell out of it? Because I actually think in listening that we have the, we have the elements here. We just haven't packaged it in the way that I think you're asking for. Dr. Hilgas, I think so, you're, you're raising a really interesting point. What I, what I find interesting about the label smart city technologies right. is the, the immediate applicability. Those two areas go really hand in hand because if you're, one thing that I didn't mention earlier is, is energy consumption. consumption. I, I assume that yes. every energy will be all over these, these curricula. But interesting, interesting thought. I, I have to ponder that a little bit. I, I do want to make sure, and I, I apologize, I don't want to put you on the spot, but I think it will be very interesting to hear the thoughts of our SGA representation as well. If, if that's okay, I don't want to put you on the spot, but please feel free to to just uh, share your thoughts on, on this kind of curriculum with, with us as well, if, if that's okay with you. Yeah, with that, I'd say just uh, like high technology computer science focused areas are always kind of difficult because they seem kind of entertaining from the outside, but once you get into them, you understand how difficult and hard they are to do, to where a lot of people go in with these high hopes, but then they end up dropping out because it's just not what they thought. They thought it'd be more fun, but it's really mm. slow, long <laughs> process to mm. do those. It's hard. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, as I'm listening to this conversation, and I'm new here, but I'm trying to put it into the context of work that I do and clients that I work with, and it occurs to me that... If I apologize, can you come closer it, to the mic? It mic-up? occurs Thank to you. me... Um, that it might be worthwhile for, for this committee and for the college in general to, to think about this issue from a slightly different point of view. Your concern, your concern with how the college is going to be uh, offering a curriculum that is going to prepare a workforce that's relevant to what we sense that employers currently need. I will suggest that there is a chicken or the egg phenomena happening here that must be taken into consideration and that is that and this relates to the smart cities concept um, employers there are, there are some employers who are capable of thinking in the weeds but also thinking at 40,000 feet most don't think at 40,000 feet they think in the weeds and the problem, there's an opportunity for the college in that in planning the curriculum, it should be informed by our awareness of how the macro environment is changing in ways that our employer constituents are not aware. So that it may be that one of the things that the college should look at offering periodically are, are uh, seminars for local employers informing them about such things for instance like have a seminar for people who own bars informing them of the technology that's currently actually in use where there are essentially no bartenders there are no bartenders there are several places down in, in las vegas where you go into the bar and you have essentially essentially uh, uh, iot machinery where you as a consumer sit down at the bar, you, either you punch in what you want in your drink or you, you select from a menu, but then they have uh, basically machinery that mix and dispense the drink that you want and the only person who's in there other than the, the customers is someone who may be refilling the, uh, the, the ingredient dispensers. Now, I, I would bet that most people operating bars in, in Carson City, or rather in Reno, are unaware of that technology or that it, is, in fact, is being deployed. Um, but it is also the kind of technology that 
when it when it pops, it will it it's not going to just change the uh, beverage dispensing uh, facilities in Reno. It'll change it almost overnight throughout the United States. Now, and that has momentous momentous consequences. I would also say that we're sort of like in the situation that this country was in when automobiles were were still just being introduced, and you had you had two groups of people. One would win and the other would lose. You had chassis chassis manufacturers who were building chassis for horse-drawn carts, and you had other chassis manufacturers who were aware that, gee whiz, something called an internal combustion engine has been created, and we should at least be prepared to produce chassis that can, can take an engine as opposed to, opposed to taking a horse. One segment of the industry blossomed, the other one went out, when it went out of existence, it went out of existence almost overnight. As, a, as an educational institution preparing the workforce, some part of our time must be, must be devoted to thinking what changes, what momentous changes are happening in the, in the macro environment that, that can have a, literally an overnight impact on the way in which our employer constituents are going to have to operate their businesses that they're unaware of. And we've got to get that information to them. We have to get that, first make them aware and, and, and at the same time prepare them, be prepared to prepare the workforce that they will need. Students may have the same issue as it relates to transferability as well as applicability. I think you're raising some really interesting points. Um, to your Dr. Hilgerson's point earlier, um, the, the difference, the balance between artificial intelligence and something uh, labeled as, as smart city technologies, people may not, and, and I, I look forward to, to, to feedback on that, people may not, students may not necessarily realize how highly transferable something as AI is to, to different industries. If we package that as smart city technologies, we may provide a, a high level of, of relatable um, applicability to certain technologies that we want young people to, to study and to, 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 to achieve skills and, and expertise in. Great, great point. Thank you. If, if I could come back to the development versus deployment conversation, because I like that framework, I think, and I'll, and I'll switch it into another sector. I'll put it into a renewable energy, which as a side note, our renew renewable energy is all but non-existent because there's just not jobs out there. And I think that's kind of some of the, everything we look at is how many jobs there are. We have solar, wind, and geothermal. Um, solar's the only one that's hanging on but we're looking at forward, you mentioned sustainability, we're looking at sustainability technicians, we're looking at lithium ion batteries because it's relevant. But to use the, the solar as an example, um, the development of the photo, photovoltaic cells, the panels on the house, the, uh, the wall units, the batteries, that sort of thing that store all that. To me, that development is, a, is not a technician level, that's more of a um, that's more of a university graduate, maybe even a PhD or somebody out there who's had a, a, more training on the engineering side. And the deployment piece to me is what we do a lot of, and that's somebody who can install that and maintain it. And that's kind of back to the, the 127 where we have three jobs that might be university, or three jobs at our university level for every seven jobs in the technical sector. And as a community college, um, I know we switched from deployment to development. I don't know that we would be doing a whole lot of development, more so we're doing um, more of the implementation and the actual deployment of the technology. And the, the Gigafactory is a good example. Our students, um, although, I mean, again, our students come in multiple ways and they go multiple places. So if they come in a two-year pathway and end up going to UNR and graduating with a PhD in engineering, they could very well be a rock star that created the robot but somebody who goes through our Panasonic program is not gonna be the one who creates that robot. They're the one that's gonna be able to use that robot and keep it moving efficiently um, and working on it. And so a lot of what we do fundamentally, especially in technical sciences, and Julie may, um, with more transfer degrees, may speak uh, to a different angle on it, but in, at least in my division, technical sciences, putting people into the workplace for those jobs, a lot of it is deployment and maintenance of everything that's been deployed and handed down and the changing technology behind it. Because we could be talking about automated street lights and the next thing you know, we gotta have five technicians out there on the poles fixing it. And, and that's really, to me, we do both, but I, th I really think we're more on the deployment side. Um, but we do have the pathways that lead all the way up. And 
Oh, go ahead. I, I was just going to say, I, you know, I think it's kind of similar to what we see in, 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 in uh, the medical field, right? Uh, so for every one doctor, there are, uh, requires seven or eight nurses or something like that uh, that end up being required for that position. A and, and if you think about our educational continuum for the health sciences, from a CNA right up to an MD or a neurosurgeon, right, uh, we expect our uh, MDs and, uh, and doctoral level individuals through medical schools to be doing research on new methods for solving cancer and curing cancer and to work with partner organizations in doing so. We expect our nurses and CNAs to be providing the base level of health care uh, and when that cure is developed uh, to be able to help implement it across the institution. And that's, that's more of where our community co colleges live is in that uh, being at the forefront of the once developed how to appropriately deploy so that companies and private sector and medical industry uh, aren't sitting here saying, well, we know what to do, we just don't have the people to do it, uh, you know, and, and we need help with that. Yeah. Uh, Joan Anini is our UNR representative. Would you mind sharing uh, the thought process to you as it relates to, your, to smart city technologies uh, at UNR? You know, I can't specifically talk to, to that program at UNR, but I definitely see, uh, to your point, the, the opportunity to work together. And I think that, that if that, um, if this is a priority, I think that that pathway concept, I think, is something to explore um, from, from both ends. Thank you. And I was going to say, so from our conversation here, I understand it much more as sort of innovative curriculum and its ability to embed in a variety of um, disciplinary training and could have, a, you know, really great outcomes in ways we can't even imagine yet. And so for us to sort of package that at the technician level is different than perhaps um, trying to bring it into the pathway toward the transferable degree. So for us to be able to embed it into, say, a transfer computer science degree, we really need to coordinate with the university because our students are segueing. They have their curriculum in mind based on what they want to transfer into. And so if, if we need to be embedding that curriculum so that they're getting that exposure in their first two years and then that segues into the expectations that the second two years at the university are going to um, you know, further sort of develop that curriculum, then I think we should have that conversation. Agreed, agreed, Dr. Williams. At a, at a highly, uh, this, this noise. Oh, I'm just saying yes. This noise, <laughs> I, I, this noise dance, yes, I know, really I think nice. Lisa, I, I see think it more now is happening curriculum. in the weight room downstairs. Um, I wonder if, if we could, uh, do you mind going down there and just <laughs> figuring like out what's going on? <laughs> we send our bodybuilder down. Yeah, the body yeah. Yeah. Just straighten yeah. him out. Dr. Williams. Um, I'm Dr. Ellsworth, I'm sorry. Amy isn't here. I'm Julie Ellsworth. Yeah, there's a weight room right below us. Sorry. <laughs> My goodness, did I mess that up? I apologize. That's okay. It's the yeah. first time we're meeting. Um, to to your point, at a at a at a very oversimplified level, the question, the two questions are deployment versus development. Do we want to lead or do we want to follow? Do we want to just engage in step number one or step number two? And secondly, and this is highly oversimplified, do we want to serve a population of roughly two hundred and fifty thousand people? or 7.5 billion people. Again, this is highly mm -hmm. simplified, mm -hmm. but, but that's exactly the thought process that we, that we need to, uh, to, to follow. So great, great point. I do have a question for our legal counsel, if that's okay. Mm -hmm. pay attention. <laughs> uh, and, and not to put Dr. Komori on, uh, on the spot, but um, as, uh, as I happen to know, this is part of your, your expertise, and since Dr. Komori from UNR is, is um, a new advisor to the TMZC um, IAC. I again, yes would be great, and no is accepted as well because I did not, uh, I did not check with, with either one of you. Is it legally, is it, is it proper, is it, is it okay if um, I ask Dr. Komori to comment to share his thoughts uh, coming from UNR and, and bringing this expertise with the rest of the group as it relates to smart city technologies? Can I, I'll, I'm gonna repeat your question. Is, is it all right for, I don't know, I don't Dr. remember Komori. his name. I, I would like, <laughs> Dr. If participate in this discussion. Yes. I would yes, like Sash to comment. He's, okay. would just be I, I just wanted comment. to make sure that it's. Yeah, it would be just public following. comment. That would be fine. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Is that okay with you? Yeah. 
There's there a is microphone a right here. Yeah. Wondering the same thing. A little bit less uh, formal than that. Which is good. Thank you. Thank you very yeah. much. No, no, no. Th thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, when I had a chance to look at the report that uh, Dean had put together, the first thing that struck me was uh, we are trying to brand a program. We are trying to brand a uh, program on public uh, policy or in, uh, uh, urban planning. There are two reasons why we do that. Number one, uh, it helps us attract more students. Uh, number two, it, it uh, helps us uh, meet certain need in the society, right? And from both those points, right off the bat, you can say that the economy right now is not at a point where it can sustain a program in uh, urban planning or whatever. So I went back to what we do when we try to introduce new courses or new programs. Even before I can get a program authorized or approved at the university level, I need to show that I have the, all the required courses offered over a period of time. There's a significant interest that is shown by student enrollment. And uh, I need to demonstrate that consolidating these courses as a particular program is somehow going to benefit the department, the college, and the university. So from that standpoint, I say, well, if I look at this, and rather than use a buzzword which kind of uh, either alienates people or uh, brings all kinds of people in, I say, let's forget about the buzzword and just look at what we are trying to do and why we need to do it. And having been in the industry for several years and being on the practicing side of this thing for several years, the single thing that I see that is uh, going to drive the uh, courses, the student interests, as well as market needs is what technology is doing. If you don't address what the technology is doing, then basically it's not going to be very helpful. So from that standpoint, the 127 concept is really good. If you see where the need of the market today is, is in data scientists. So if you, are a, you can't find enough data scientists to fill the jobs that are out there. Uh, a person with a, a master's background in data scientists starts off at $120,000 a year. If you have a PhD, you're looking at $150,000 plus. And this is without just fresh out of college. Now, we can't, even at that salary level, we cannot find the people to staff those positions. So certainly at the community college level, there's no way we can train people uh, and be able to do that stuff. So if we follow the same model, so we are not looking for data scientists, we are not looking for data engineers, but we are looking for data technicians. And where is the need? If you look at what technology has done, mobile applications, uh, uh, internet technologies, connectivity, uh, mobile computing, all these things have affected the way businesses run. One of the biggest challenges today is data collection, data management, data security. Uh, who has the data? Who manages the data? This is a big thing. So having access to uh, people who know how to set up databases, how to migrate data between databases, and now everything is in the cloud. So what do you need to do if you are going to migrate your data into the cloud? That is very, very important. And then what are the security implications? What are the privacy implications? Every organization needs it, whether it's Renown Health, whether it's Sierra Nevada Corporation, or even the governor's office. Everybody needs to manage data. So who cal collects the data? Who manages the data? How do you assess the privacy requirement? Those are very, very important. And it's not the question of, uh, can these jobs be done by somebody in uh, Mumbai or in China or anywhere else? No, these jobs have to be done here. The servers could be anywhere. The Amazon could be running their servers in, the, in wa Washington State, or they could be having it in India. It doesn't matter. But we need to know what, who our constituents are, what data they need, and what they need to do on their side. So I think there's a big need for us to look at two, three, five years down the road, see where the technology is going to be, what the needs of our constituents are, and try to plan something today so that when we graduate students two, three, five years from now, they are ready to hit the ground running. There's a need for the technology, and I think from that standpoint, this is a very good discussion to have, and I would rather go back and rather than worry about what the program needs to look like, I would say what are the specific courses that we need and what kind of hands-on training we can provide the students so that when they graduate from the program, the market is ready to pick them up because they need somebody just like uh, Dean was mentioning, 
you need somebody who can run the assembly line, but they don't have to be trained on a program that is sponsored by uh, Tesla or, or by Panasonic. They have the expertise. They can, if Tesla is really interested in those people, they can take them, put them to a week or two weeks of training, and they can get it done. So that, that's my just saying. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sure. Do you mind if I speak around for questions, please? Sure. Do you mind if I summarize Please. some takeaways? So, so I sense that we'll probably move on to the next needs assessment, but I wanted to offer a, a, just a, a synthesis and how that synthesis might affect next steps after listening to this really great conversation. The first thing I have, the first bit, I'm looking at Dean Julie Ellsworth, Dean of Sciences, is to, I think TMCC should explore the capacity for the development side. Again, we do, and it, for the, on the, and this would be transfer education. And so, just for those of you who are new, we have about 11,000 credit-seeking students every year, and of those, about 6,000, between six and 7,000, their intent is to transfer. So they're not doing workforce training. They are in the hardcore freshman, sophomore level experiences. They are taking, you know, if they're, I mean, and a great example is Kim Tran, who, high school student finished her AA degree at TMCC and has been accepted to Stanford, full free scholarship in, and I think it was an engineering field. And so, so we really do all of that here too. And I don't wanna diminish our capacity for that because we're really strong in some of these uh, community college, freshman, sophomore level preparatory transfer experiences. So I think we want to explore that, which means that the next needs assessment might be done by a different dean. And, it, and, uh, and I would work with uh, Elena in marketing to try to brand it in a way, because I'm not sure an 18 year old knows what smart city means. I think they do know what AI is. Mm -hmm. Am I right? Yeah. Would, it, would it help if, yeah. we, if we add more people to basically build a, a small subcommittee I'm, to develop the next, to make it easier I'm for- here. I'm getting here, Okay, go ahead, please. And my second thing is I think uh, listening to what Vice Chancellor McKinnon noted about involving industry, I think it would be great. Uh, Edon can help, Nancy or Mike, who are also on this IAC, can help connect us with the breadware, uh, for example, with there are many new software companies and it'd be great to get them involved in the study from the get-go, which I think is where you're going. Yes. And then the third thing I want to say is I loved your idea clip about seminars for new technology and it reminded me of uh, Oregon State University in Bend, Oregon does a fun thing where they do, they call them pub talks, so they, they literally have these <laughs> at a pub and they were extremely well attended and it was the university uh, holding, uh, having a fun space and inviting uh, business and industry to listen and to hear about some of the new technologies. And I think TMCC could play a role in this. So I, di I didn't want to lose that thought because I think it was a, a, f a really good good idea that we can do very easily. So anyway. Right. And the only thing I would add, I think university needs to be at the table of discussion you as betcha. well. Because anytime we start talking about changing yep. the first two years of a transfer degree, those things are very intimately linked. Right. And we need to be discussing specifically what courses and what sort of curricular enhancements we're talking about. Yep, sounds I, good. I couldn't be happy, I couldn't be more thankful. We have TMCC, we have UNR, and we have the private sector industry. We are going to take this into the next round and develop a very targeted, specific assessment. Kyle, thank you very much for, for getting us here already. This was a fantastic yeah, conversation. Great. Uh, great. Thank you very much. So yes, we are moving on. Uh, John, another question for you. John, sorry, another question for you um, with your permission because I, I really hesitate to stifle, to cut short uh, discussions and conversations that actually move us forward because we don't meet that often. We may go uh, a little bit beyond the schedule 1030 with your permission. Oh, yes. Okay. We will have a, a, a brief recess, a short uh, recess. I, I was thinking of 15 minutes initially. We, we may want to you know, um, cut that down to 10 minutes after the quality assurance needs assessment discussion. Um, Amy, okay. would you mind just sharing the highlights with sure. us about the... Sure. So... Again. Okay, so this, this time I, I insist that we have nameplates. Okay, so <laughs> Julie Ellsworth, Dr. Ellsworth here, Dean of Science, and um, the lead writer was um, 
Amy Williams, Dean Amy Williams. So that's why you're getting this. Right, We're confused. Yes. <coughs> um, so, and I'll start with the end as well. Um, but again, this was um, looked at from the aspect of packaging a program. Um, so from the delivery aspect of what we're talking about. And um, so bottom line, so this idea of quality assurance technician and um, sort of its a feasibility, um, we feel there's a lot of potential here. And our discussions led us to this idea where there are sort of common knowledge and skills that someone in a quality assurance arena need to have. Um, but then we we saw opportunities, and this is really from coming from Amy's area and my area, op oh, and Kyle's area, um, opportunities where once that core knowledge and skills are covered, that there could be applications in food science, um, quality assurance in terms of um, laboratory quality, and then manufacturing, qu manufacturing quality assurance, so that we essentially um, use the courses that we had, um, that was our approach toward what could we package together toward um, having these tracks or pathways for students um, that we think there's, there's need. We want to sort of further um, sort of engage employers and confirm, again, this is the notion that are there going to be jobs with this sort of package um, that students can then launch themselves into. So we went so far as to develop an actual um, sort of a curricular pathway, um, which can sometimes be a great conversation starting point. So when we can um, now take this, um, if we're so directed, to kind of have the conversation. So do we agree that these are the you know, common, strat common, common information that they need to know? Um, and then do these, so that's the core. So the Appendix A kind of goes through a package that we could offer from courses that we already have um, and that we could put together sort of the, um, this AA with the core in logistics and safety and statistics that we s see would serve a, a couple of different tracks and then the manufacturing emphasis would be one direction students could go and that would lead to a different set of jobs than the food pharma micro emphasis would lead to another set of jobs um, and both of these tracks have had um, you know conversations in this leap kind of pathway idea um, and then um, we think it has potential. There were some mixed results in terms of, you know, what kind, numbers of jobs would be, um, you know, the opportunity at the end. But that was sort of where we left it with this level of development. Thank you. Great assessment. Let me, let me kick this off. And one thing that concerns me, and Lisa, this is, this is for the record so that we can, after this meeting, decide how we're going to handle this moving forward. Unfortunately, since we're not meeting our quorum uh, due to the, to, the, to the small number of attendants today, I'm concerned about the fact that we will not be able to take any action to move things forward, whether it's a new assessment or the next step assessment or moving this into, into the next gear before August, and I would like to just explore and discuss after this meeting um, possibilities to, to, to schedule a meeting actually in between so that we don't lose another two, three months before we can actually start taking action on that. I, I do think we can take action without an official IAC approval. It would be nice to get that at some point down the road, but, but it is common for us to move forward on programs. I mean, the other one I wanted to mention today Marie, for Marisa is our nursing department is looking very s seriously now into a Bachelor in Science of Nursing now that CSN has passed. So it's nice to have the blessing of the IAC. It's a nice to have, but it's not a have to have. So we could, I you know. Since I beg your pardon. Oh, uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> I knew, I, yeah. Anyway, yeah, good, so, good. so, so I, I That's think, good, whatever progress yeah. we can make in between. Right. Uh, just, just with as, as little, little bureaucracy and technicalities as possible and still just, you know, following the rules. Okay, let me kick this off. And again, this, this needs to be a good dialogue. This is a fantastic assessment. I think a couple of things are missing. I'm going to get right into that. Um, if, I, if I look at 1.1.0, the brief description and primary educational objectives, uh, you are referencing, you're referencing wholesale retail products, electronics, pharmaceuticals, and clothing. I've spent 12 years of my life in international 
quality management, and regulatory affairs. There is not a single industry worldwide, there is not a single industry, manufacturing services or goods, that does not require quality control, quality assurance, quality engineering, quality management, and quality auditing. So I believe this is a, a fantastic start. This is very well researched, but we, we probably have an opportunity here again to, to blow up the scope and just go actually much bigger. As it relates to, to Reno and Carson City and Northern Nevada for that matter, one of the most important industries, and that's an industry that we want to strengthen in the area, is aerospace. Aerospace is missing here, super important. Um, I, I spend you know, time myself in, in, in aerospace, automotive, medical device, and pharmaceutical packaging, and, and these industries are just highly regulated. If, you, if we go buy a cheeseburger, uh, you have no idea through how many layers of quality control, quality assurance, quality engineering, quality management, quality auditing, and su supplier quality auditing, and all of that that goes through before we actually get a chance to eat that. So aerospace, defense, medical devices, medical devices and pharmaceuticals are industries that are really underrepresented in Northern Nevada. And if we want to attract those industries, we, we have to have these programs. Not, no, the programs, we have to have the graduates. We have to have the talent pool. How do we get there? By, by providing the right programs and sending to, to the industry the right signals that we are ready to provide to, to output the employees that you need with the right skill sets. Um, and then food and automotive, automotive obviously, as well. Um, the other areas that I, that I would just like to comment on the entire assessment, and maybe this is by, by design because, you know, one step at a time we want to test the waters and, and see how this works out. We are very much looking at quality technicians. If you, if you look at, at the food chain, whenever I look at a company, I, I distinguish first of all between strategic decisions and tactical decisions. It's, this is very important because um, one function typically doesn't do the other function well and both need to work in concert. If you look at, at any regulated organization, you will have all these, these, these layers, inspectors, technicians, engineers, quality engineers, quality managers, quality auditors, and so on. And the decision that they make, the, the, the purpose that they fulfill, the, purpose that they, the purposes that they fulfill um, are typically uh, distinguishable between tactical management, tactical decisions, and strategic management. Someone who makes strategic management decisions will absolutely not have a caliper in, in his or her hands to measure the, uh, the, the dimensions of, of an incoming product. But that person will, will possibly put in place SPC, statistical process control, and, and proactive measures to, to maintain, to, for, to foresee quality issues, potential quality issues, and to, uh, to prevent them for the future. So I would like to, to suggest that we really open up the scope from quality technicians, which is, which is by far not as demanding, and, and look at quality engineering, which is very, very STEM heavy, very STEM heavy. As a matter of fact, uh, if, you, if you go to the ASQ, the American Society for Quality, which is the premier organization, not only in the US, but probably worldwide, and I, I'm looking at it from a European perspective as well, because the Europeans really copy a lot of the ASQ framework, um, the quality engineering program is typically the toughest to, to go through, and the exam is the toughest to pass as it relates to quality disciplines. So I would like to, to open the scope to quality engineering, quality management, and quality auditing as well. Uh, to you, on the second page, there was one statement uh, that, that just drew my attention, which is uh, in the, let's say, the third paragraph, kind of the mid, in the middle of the third paragraph. And I'm going to quote, employment in more technical fields like chemical or computer manufacturing might require a degree in chemistry, engineering, or computer science. As a matter of fact, I should actually include the other sentence before. Uh, QA technicians who perform simple pass-fail tests on products often need only a high school diploma. Employment in more technical fields, like chemical or computer manufacturing, might require a degree in chemistry, engineering, or computer science. Uh, I, I want to reinforce the, the, the fact that quality assurance is not industry-specific. They are not industries that we are going to serve well with quality assurance and quality control, quality management, quality engineering, and others that we don't because we need that worldwide everywhere. Everything we touch goes through these, these principles. Um, we should much more 
as, as TMCC, we should much more, building and, and developing the talent, we should much more distinguish between what is important as far as skills and expertise to make tactical decisions, what is important to make strategic decisions, because this is how we're going to help companies in these industries. And I think that is really what we had in mind when we were thinking about these different optional tracks. Because when we talked, when I've talked to employers who say are in food manufacturing, what they see as the basis, the fundamental disciplinary information they need to cover includes microbiology and microbiology lab, right. which is something that is not going to be necessarily on the mind of someone involved in manufacturing. Right. And so, depending on what they're manufacturing. Going back to the clean room <laughs> that, that, that Kyle mentioned before. Um, and so, you know, we kind of worked on the curriculum from that perspective that there are going to be core fundamentals and um, safety and statistics and you know, some core fundamentals. And then it, it's going to, I think, need to kind of take shape at the technician level, take shape as to what are going to be the needs in specific industries. Um, and so we went with those two branches. So but can there I could be many others. Okay, because the third track might be aerospace. Yes. Yeah. Quick, quick comment. The one person I mentioned that came in looking for the clean room and some assurance was an aerospace industry. Was an aerospace? Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Uh, UAV. So. Well, just imagine how high the demand is for pharmaceutical companies, medical device companies, and, and obviously food companies. We could also be, uh, you know, we didn't do the analysis in this way, but um, some of our conversations here are with, if you're talking about someone on track to go toward an engineering degree, um, and that this is, you know, again, could be curricular enhancement on that path, or it could be sort of post back opportunities where we have certificates with a collection of courses that it might be someone who's a, finished um, a bachelor's in engineering mm -hmm. or chemistry or biology, and then on after that, potentially offering a collection of certificates where there would be sort of adding that technical aspect of quality assurance and that kind of background. Maybe we can go in that direction as well. Yeah, that's a great idea. Thank you. You know, one of the things I'm thinking about it with this is that as you're looking at developing those those uh, tech, technician level degree, degree programs, somewhere, somewhere in the development of the curriculum, whoever's involved with that should be grounded in, in constantly looking at what changes are taking place in the macro environment. Because much of the problem that we're facing now is the rate, of, the rate at which technological change is happening is so rapid that if those who are going to be teaching are not making sure that their skill sets are right on the cutting edge constantly, I mean, it's not like you can go to school and, uh, you know, learn first aid and then, and then be a nurse, f you know, for the next 10 years and never have to learn anything else. I mean, <laughs> that, that doesn't, it doesn't work that way. So I really think that, that, that this, the need to stay technically current in the, in the process of preparing these curriculum, in the process of teaching them, is going to be very, very, very impor important in the way the, in the future that it hasn't been in the past. Jared, may I ask you a question? May I ask you to, do you mind sharing your major with us? Uh, I'm not really pursuing a major, I'm more going toward business. Okay. Uh, any specific interest as a as probably the youngest uh, representative here. Cybersecurity? Cybersecurity. We're working on it. Cybersecurity. <laughs> what functions, what applications do you foresee having an interest in cybersecurity as it relates to your quality assurance in cybersecurity? And basically, with any organization, with any company, with any team <coughs> that you would possibly work with later on, uh, in the field of cybersecurity? 
since cybersecurity is very, everyone kind of needs it, especially with this increasing like technological dependency, uh, it's basically almost entirely a part of quality insurance in which people like cybersecurity teams have to make it and then they need to constantly check it over, like go over it, make sure that there's no holes in it. And for cybersecurity, there's actually a growing market more that's just with freelancers to where they don't even have their own cybersecurity teams. They hire people to check their own sec uh, security systems and basically tell them to break into their system for them and just yep. make uh, like so that they can find all the holes and then patch them up. Are you familiar with the American Society for Quality? And, and if not, I, I don't blame you. Many people are not. As I said before, the, the premier organization for quality management, anything that, that relates to quality in the U.S. and for that matter worldwide. Uh, they offer uh, a certified, this is a very highly regarded, a certified software quality engineer. So I, I assume if you pursue a career in cybersecurity, that would possibly be one of the credentials that you, that you would look at, that you would be interested in, that you would want to pursue. What if we could provide similar, comparable, or maybe even better uh, curricular programs right here at TMCC to help you and your colleagues and your, your peers uh, to be really successful in cybersecurity or whatever you want to pursue? Yeah, I think that would be really good. Thank you. Thank you for your, for your feedback. John, from a workforce development viewpoint, from, from the viewpoint of Nevada Works, what are your thoughts as it relates to the necessity uh, of quality assurance in the area um, and TMCC's active role in, in providing that specifically trained talent? Well, that's interesting because as we talk to employers, um, they often refer to the quality of the uh, applicants for openings that they have um, and those new hires uh, as to the quality of their preparedness to be an employee. Um, and it oftentimes is more about their soft skills than it is their academic skills or their occupational skills that they're they're referring to. So that that's an interesting question, um, and not one that we probably approach other than the quality of the employee or the potential employee, rather than has how they fit into the quality of the day-to-day -day operations of the organization. Interesting. Uh, without stereotyping, but some of the best engineers quality engineers, software engineers, mechanic engineers that I've ever worked with had some of the lousiest soft skills. <laughs> um, and typically, I appreciate them for, for what they do offer as it relates to the technical expertise and try to, to leave the interaction, the, the human interaction to minimum, but interesting, Marisa, interesting I viewpoint. It, with respect to um, healthcare, this is a large focus for hospitals anyway, quality assurance and quality control and risk management. Um, there's a large focus on infection control and um, the process that people go through to make man and manufacture drugs because we have a huge shortage of, I mean, it's, it's gone through a huge swing, right? We have an opioid crisis, but yet there is some patients that need it, like with surgery and, and narcotics and those kinds of things, and we have a huge shortage with that. So the process that you go through to manufacture those medications, I mean, typically is done outside of Nevada, and we don't have enough um, nurses that, and maybe you do this as a certificate program, but nurses that are well-versed in quality management and risk assessment. So when you're looking at infections, there's a process that you go through. I mean, we know what cause infections, but are people adhering to that? You know, physicians that come in to see patients, are they adhering to the processes that they need to? And so surveying and looking at quality and risk, and then you have surveyors that come in to the hospitals to, um, like, joint commission to accredit them. So I think that's a huge gap in healthcare. Yes. That's another track. It's a yeah. great idea. Nothing that we 
that we touch doesn't go through, right. or in other words, everything that we touch that, that we're surrounded by goes through quality management. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Marisa. And there's been Very some good big problems, too, with um, sterility of the instruments, you know. Yeah, So absolutely. Vice Chancellor, um, are there any insights that, from a statewide standpoint, TMCC kind of initiated the dialogue around quality assurance programs. At this point, um, I, uh, I, I hear that, that Southern Nevada is interested in, in, in something similar in further you know, pursuing this, this dialogue and possibly the, the development of adequate programs. Are there any insights that you can possibly share with us from a statewide standpoint as it relates to other regions in the state, how they look at it, how they prioritize quality assurance and quality management? Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you know, I think for uh, for a field like this, uh, we really only have two regions that are highly focusing on it, and it's th th this area of northern Nevada, which I would loop in uh, Carson City and those employers and some of the manufacturing facilities there, uh, the WNC services, um, as well as, you know, Clark County. And uh, so this has not been a, a top point of focus for our uh, for our our community colleges in terms of trying to meet some of those top 10 demand fields right now uh, that we you know feel grossly behind on but that doesn't mean that this isn't something we should pay attention to and I've been taking notes on some of the great points that that all of you have been bringing up and I think it's the type of thing where uh, if we are able to uh, demonstrate success with TMCC uh, as we've done in many other examples uh, and I would, you know, point to what we've done with advanced manufacturing here in particular as a terrific example, and that has spilled over to other colleges. And uh, our system's small and nimble enough that, uh, that that's often our best way of uh, approaching challenges like this is to experience that. Uh, you know, one of the challenges right now, in particular in southern Nevada, is logistics, uh, logistics management. That is the fastest growing and most emerging field in the southern Nevada area, according to the LVGEA, uh, and they are uh, desperate to get uh, technicians who can get trained in logistics management um, as that area becomes more and more of a logistics hub uh, for the entire western United States. So uh, even there, I think there's opportunities for quality assurance. And so, you know, I, I see this as a potentially good opportunity for uh, learning what we can at TMCC uh, and figure out how we apply that at other institutions as appropriate with employer demand. Thank you. Let's take a break and resume at 10.30. So I, may I ask a question? I'm, I'm concerned about those of you who have left jobs to come here today and one, op one option we could do, Elmar, yeah. is wrap up this discussion and then table the strategic planning discussion for the full body of the IAC. What, what do you think? I, I'm, uh, yes, I, anyway, I, I wonder if we should I, I call the members to ask them who can stay. Uh, I know, I, I think that, that yeah. this is just, that this is just fair, and I see a lot of, of, of heads nodding. Yeah. Um, John, with, with your permission, we're going to. You're, you're, you don't really, you're not tabling, you're just not doing it. Right, okay. Okay. So you just put it on we're going standard. to. Yeah. Yeah. You're just not doing it. Good, okay. We. But that's don't really vote. Just, I assume nobody wants a break. It's the will of the body. <laughs> Just gonna get some coffee. Thank Good. We are. Coffee. Yeah. Well, we will move. Uh, we will defer item number six. Yeah. With everybody's agreement to our next meeting in August. Um, Dr. Hilgersen, what is going to be done on, on item number five on both programs? Just in short summary, um, prior to August, prior to the next meeting, what do we want to accomplish? And it's, it's, it's good to, to point out that, as you, as you correctly said earlier, that we do not need the IAC's approval to move forward and put some work into, into um, the, the new assessment for smart city technologies. and moving the quality assurance um, program further ahead. So what will be done prior to the next meeting? So I think what I'm hearing is that we will continue to explore the, um, the development of a program that 
uh, of, around artificial intelligence and that skill set uh, that would help fuel a smart city economy, which is not quite here yet. But secondly, I think that what I heard from all of you is that for the most part, quality assurance is a good idea. And we've gleaned a, another of opportunities related to a healthcare track and an aerospace track that we can kind of look into. Um, I thought that your idea, Julie, about the post-baccalaureate certificate program, which could be part of our community learning or co continuing ed workforce, even on the non-credit side, might be a fascinating thing to explore. So, so I think we're, we're going to continue to move forward definitely on quality assurance, but do some more fleshing out and development so that we could share it at the next meeting. And then we're uh, going to continue preliminary explorations around some of the skill sets connected with the Internet of Things and, and invite some of, and I can help with that, Kyle, inviting some of the EDON new startups to be part of a, a, a forum of some kind. Um, UNR, including UNR, including UNR and, um, and yeah. private sector, and probably not yep. just limited to breadware, but to to bigger players in that field in the area as well. That sounds great. That's yep. a good idea. And maybe um, Dr. Dr. Kamori would like to help us with that. So uh, anyway, so I think that would be great. The other thing I want to say about the strategic plan very quickly is um, I do think it's a conversation that really is better when, when there are more individual members, but I hope you have an opportunity to take a good look at it before our next meeting, uh, because the, what we're going to ask you is, of all of these indicators, are there a handful that, that you would like us to share with you at every meeting, uh, including some that are not here, like budget updates, for example. So we talked about that a couple of meetings ago. So, uh, but you've got it now. Uh, I do think it's a conversation that's probably, it could be at least 45 minutes on that. So um, anyway, but thank you for being here today. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, we are we're close to wrapping this meeting up. Um, our next item is new business. Is there any new business? Can I just ask a, a, a point of Please, order or, or housekeeping item? Can you just confirm, Mr. Chairman, is the next meeting uh, Friday, August 10th. Uh, do I have that date correct? That's correct. Okay, just want to make sure for everybody. Yeah, that's correct, know, Vice Chancellor. Make sure I have it on our calendars. August 10th. I needed yes. that reminder. And, and there will be obviously there will be an, an invitation sent out as well and a Terrific. reminder. Yep. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, is there any new business? Hearing none. Um, we are going to go around the room for a quick takeaways. Keep your comments to your two minutes or less. <clears throat> After that, we move on to public comment, and then we are very close to, uh, to the end of the meeting. Julie, do you mind? Just so my your, summary of... Um, your, your, your takeaways, your, your takeaways. We started this last, uh, last meeting during the, the most recent meeting in, in February. We want to make sure that we, we have this full engagement of every member who is sitting here. Everyone um, is obviously very busy, has, has, has work and jobs, and want to make sure that we use your time wisely and, and that we really get all the value from our IEC members. So I, I would love to hear your takeaways. Honestly, my takeaway is that um, when you drill down and envision a program and then all it takes is a conversation with 15 other people to realize all of the different directions and possibilities it has in terms of coming to fruition and all the areas that it could touch and that you didn't even imagine. So. I would like to think of the um, sort of report we gave as a work in progress um, because it really it, it needs these you know sets of audiences and the feedback in order to evolve into sort of the best it can be. Thank you. Elena. I guess my takeaway is kind of along the same lines that as we develop new programs, we're so heavily focused on curriculum. We heavily focused on the um, um, demands of the um, labor market, and all of those data points are extremely important, but we also have to keep in mind sort of the marketing aspect of it and right down to the name of the program, making sure that it is um, not only relevant to the workforce needs of the community, but actually appealing to, to the prospective students and resonates with them and maybe even entices them uh, to consider that as a pathway. 
So one, one takeaway and one giveaway. The takeaway is that um, even though we're, we're running full speed ahead trying to fill all the slots in the economy, we still have to keep looking at what's the next thing, which is now, it used to be 10 years out, now it's like 10 months out. Um, and the, the giveaway is, is for those of you on IAC who interact with the community, um, we do have a number of scholarship opportunities thanks to our foundation, thanks to the governor's office for anybody who wants to train in a variety of programs, send them our way. If you hear somebody saying, I'd really like to learn more about that, we're happy to, like Elena says, try to show them what the, what the job skills are and walk them through it and then get them into a program of study. And most of the time we can pay for some or all of it, so. This is very exciting for me today to hear all this coming about. Um, it sounds like we're in finding that balance between being proactive and reactive to the needs of industry and a workforce. Uh, one thing I was thinking about is probably because I come from the Office of Prospective Students at UNR, is where are we gonna get these students? How are we going to recruit? Nevada is not known for its eager workforce specifically. Um, my husband works in the systems office at the distribution center at Walmart and he says people get fired all the time because they can't make it to work for three days. They only work three days. My daughter's an area manager for Zoo Lily and she has the same issue. We spoke to soft skills and that's definitely one of them. So I'm thinking recruiting, how would we recruit? Are we gonna recruit from California, non-traditional students who are willing to move, you know, Idaho, all these other places that are trying to grow as well. So it's something to consider. And thank you for letting me be here. I, I simply feel so complimented to have been asked to be a part of this organization. What you are concerned with is the stuff that I think about every day. And so to be able to apply what I think about to your needs um, is phenomenal. So thank you. Just thank Thankful you. to have you. I thought today was a, kind of an exciting discussion. And that, that soft skills, I know where I worked, we used to have a program that just taught people how to show up at 8 o'clock and how not to pick up a two-by-four and hit the guy in the head next to him. I mean, these, these things sound crazy, but somebody said it earlier, if you get the best trained person in the world and they don't have the basic skills to have a little bit of common sense and know what they should and shouldn't do, it's all for naught. But I, I thought that you, you raised a lot of good issues today. I, th I think maybe one of the biggest takeaways for me was uh, um, making sure that I'm looking at an item or a topic from the right perspective. Um, it, as, as we often do, we make some assumptions based on title and not content, and I think I fell victim to that, so I'll be more careful in the future. Yeah, for me, it's very similar to him, to where like the meetings are nice because it allows you to see the multiple perspectives of the multiple needs of the uh, schools and institutions that really help to clarify and make specific our goals and objectives to where we can know what we want for sure. Uh, my takeaway is that I, I enjoy this new process and I'm thankful to you. I think you're doing a great job as chair because it is really these perspectives, as Julie put it, that will make the program the best that it can be. And that's what we want at TMCC. I didn't realize that was going to rhyme. <laughs> uh, thank you for your feedback. It's, it's clearly a team effort. Yeah. And, and I'm, I'm just honored to, to serve on the TMCC IAC together with Vice Chair McCormick. So I, the idea of quality assurance for me is academically fascinating. Um, being a social science person and not an engineering or, or applied sciences um, type of a, a thinker, um, I have a student that has written her own internship description and taken it out to a company and has scored herself a sweet job because of it, um, doing quality assurance. More qualitative um, than, than the quantitative hard science type stuff, but um, I agree. I think that that is something to, to look at and something to research, and the qualitative aspects of that applied to the social science and social science research areas is, is fascinating to me. Well, and I like that we're thinking outside the box, and we're not just looking at little old Reno and a smaller college, that we're looking globally bigger and not limiting ourselves to what we've been doing or what other schools in our area are doing. And so I think that will impact the, the community at, at large. And my son lives in Idaho, and I know Boise right now is really working on their 
um, computer gener or computer programs and really trying to attract folks there. And I'm thinking, well, if Boise can do it, we should be the little college that can. And I think <laughs> this is a good conversation thinking outside the box. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I, I echo what I said earlier, which is this is one of the uh, the most fascinating and engaged IAC conversations I've been able to witness thus far, uh, and I commend you for tying it to the goals of uh, the, the system because I think that's what we want all of our IACs to be doing, uh, and I think everyone should be uh, excited about this type of direction. Um, I, I would also ask, though, that, uh, you know, I think in higher education in particular, uh, anyone who's worked in it knows that we're not very good with change. Uh, and we're not very good um, when it comes to necessarily being nimble. Our best examples of uh, nimbleness is the community colleges. Uh, and even there, sometimes we struggle. Uh, and so I, I would ask and encourage all members of the IAC as representatives of the greater community and partners at large to please continue to press the college and us and she as well uh, with with things that will help this college become uh, even greater than it already is uh, because sometimes our reaction can be no uh, and that's sort of instilled in us because we deal with struggles with funding uh, and a lot of other realities um, but I think your pushing of helping us think about things in new ways uh, is incredibly important to our success as uh, TMCC here uh, and and the same is true for the other three community colleges as well uh, so thank you. Uh, I, I want to just say my non-participation in your deliberations is because I'm a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> and I respect all of you in you, the disciplines that you bring into this room today. And I don't have that knowledge and I don't have that experience. So I try to stay out of it as much as possible and some people feel that's too much deference or why isn't he talking? I'm not talking because I really don't know. <laughs> and I want to defer to you. I answer the questions when you need me to participate, but I don't get involved. I would, in concluding that, I would point out sometimes I'm in meetings and I do participate in that way, and people put more credibility into what I say than they should. <laughs> because I'm, I don't really know. So I respect all of you. I don't participate in your discussion. I do answer the legal questions and I, and I help keep you on track. Thank you. I gotta say I learned a lot today. And my biggest takeaway was knowing that I can go to a bar and push a button and get my drink. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really excited about that. <laughs> but um, seriously, I think that it seems to me that we have um, a gap in marketing in in reaching out to some of the new things that we're doing and reaching out to students in the, at the high school level and maybe the middle school level with regards to the huge capacity and all the various things that TMCC offers. I learn something new about that all the time and I'm always amazed at what TMCC does. But um, I'm excited about the prospect of a baccalaureate program for nursing. We have huge health care shortages in this state. And um, I'm also really excited about the quality assurance piece, and it gives me um, a reason to reach out to some of the infection preventionists at the hospitals and get their perspective with regards to gaps in that area. And um, I enjoyed our conversation today, so thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm honored to serve with all of you uh, with this phenomenal group on the TMCC IAC. I want to thank particularly Julie, Kyle, and Amy for all the work that you put into your, into your preparing what we uh, had an opportunity to discuss today. There's a lot of exciting work to be done um, prior to our next meeting, which I look very much forward to. For the time being, thank you very much again for today, and I wish all of you a great weekend. The meeting is adjourned. Thank you.